Wonderful. Great. Well, as I said earlier, it's great to be with you again. Uh, I should have said earlier that we've got a little new news update booklet. So if you want to find out more about what Thrive's been doing in the last 12 months, I've put a stack of these on the table just in the foyer by the door. Do please uh, help yourself to one of those before you go home. Let me just get myself set up. I need a timer on my phone because I. You, it's wonderful that you've asked me to speak uh, in this series on Acts, but the danger is you've given me two chapters to speak on, which is a hundred verses. Uh, if we did a minute a verse, we're going to be here too long. If we do 30 seconds a verse, we're going to be here too long. So I've got a timer to, uh, to try and control my enthusiasm. Uh, I did go and speak at a church last year where the church leader in the sort of run up to the service said, Andy, I only preach for 12 minutes. <laughs> and I thought, well, what have you heard? Uh, and um, uh, several times they said to me, and you do know it's only 12 minutes, so much so that I turned around to them the, the, sort of in the week before and said, what, ha what happened if I go over 12? Because I was like, is there going to be a trap door or what's going to happen? Uh, and then I turn up at the church and there's not a clock in sight. And I'm like, oh man, how am I going to keep to 12 minutes and you're not even giving me a clock? So I think, I think it was 15 in the end, but... Um, uh, fortunately, Salt of Sword is much more giving and generous. So much so that Steve contacts me this week and says, Andy, how long do you want to preach for? And I thought, oh no, how do I answer that one? <laughs> so we'll see what we get, but we'll, we'll try not to go on too long. But why don't we pray as we start? Heavenly Father, thank you for this glorious Sunday morning. Thank you for this chance to gather together as your people to worship you to give our full attention to you. And we pray you will speak to us whatever it is you want to say to us this morning. We are open to you. So Holy Spirit, speak. Amen. So I'm hoping you've all got Bibles with you. I know Saltersford is a, a Bible-believing church. I'm trusting we're also a Bible-reading church. Uh, because we've got so much to read that we take too long to put on a screen. So we're, we are in Acts chapter 6 and 7, uh, and there's this wonderful story about Stephen, and it's Stephen we're focusing on. Uh, but it starts with a dilemma that the church is facing, and churches often face dilemmas, don't we? As, as we grow and as things change, we're like, how do we deal with this now, this situation? And how are we going to rectify this problem? Uh, and we, we join the story from last week and we hear at the end of chapter 5 in verse 42, once the apostles have experienced persecution day after day in the temple courts from house to house, they never, the apostles never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. So the church is under pressure, but the church is proclaiming the good news and the church is growing. And we pick it up, chapter 6, verse 1, the choosing of the seven. In those days when the number of disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic Jews those of Greek origin, amongst them complained against the Hebraic Jews, those of Hebrew origin, because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So we remember, don't we, from Acts 2, when they, the disciples came together and they had everything in common, uh, and we know that they are supposed to be take, looking after the poor, the widows, the orphans. This is all part of what being church is about, and yet there's this problem that's being noticed that the, the Hellenistic Jews, their widows are not being cared for as much as what it seems to be the Hebraic Jews. And so this, this issue is brought to the attention of the apostles. So it says, the 12 gathered all the disciples together and said, it would, be not, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. So the, so the apostles, the church leaders, are thinking, what are we going to do? Here's the dilemma. Actually, it's not right that certain widows are being overlooked at the cost of others. It's not right for this. This isn't how we want it to be. 
So how are we going to make sure that we've got everything in common? How are we going to make sure that the food is equally distributed? Uh, and it just shows that actually, as much as we look to the first church and think how wonderful, how exciting, they still had issues. They still had things that they needed to deal with. So what were they going to do to, to sort it out? What were the church leaders, the apostles, going to do to sort it out? Always comes down to the leaders, doesn't it? What are the leaders going to do to sort out this problem for our church? Uh, John Stott says that one of the devil's tactic for attacking the church is to distract the church from its main purpose. Uh, and I see here there's a potential to distract the apostles from their main purpose. Uh, and, we, and we hear... Here, they're, they're recognizing the, the issue. We've got to sort it. But in verse 3, we read that they come up with the solution. They say, brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. I, I think this is fantastic leadership in action because what they're going is we know our, our primary responsibility is praying and ministry of the word. This is what we're called to as the apostles. They're not saying what, it's more important to pray and to minister the word. They're saying this is what we're called to. But they're also saying feeding, feeding the widows is essential for what we do as the people of God in this place. So, so they recognize the issue, but they also recognize what their responsibility is and what their call is. Uh, and, and, and as we grow as church, we have these times when we go, uh, we, how often we hear of church leaders who are overstretched or leadership teams that are overstretched. Uh, and, and yet here we've got a, the opportunity for a, a leadership team to start to be overstretched. But they recognize that it's not what they are supposed to do. It's what we as church are supposed to do, not we as leaders are supposed to do. Uh, and, and, and I think it's amazing, isn't it? Because it's so easy as in a leadership role to give in to the temptation of distraction. That job needs doing. I'm a leader. I ought to sort it. That, that, that person needs visiting. I must visit. Or whatever it is that is, is um, tempting uh, someone in leadership to, to do more than God is asking them to do. But the apostles, the 12, know what they're called to. So what they do, they don't even go, right, well, we've got to sort it. So you, 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 and you, you're doing it. Job done, sorted. What they do is they go to the church and they say, brothers and sisters, choose seven people, choose seven men from among you. Because we've got to sort this. But we're not going to tell you who. But we'd love you as the people to choose. Who are the seven people you think should take this on? Uh, and what, what I find fascinating is they don't go, you know, this, is, a, this is, an, is an administrative task. So find people who are going to be fair. Find people who are going to be really good at making sure everyone gets, gets equal portions and no one's missed out. You know, the practical amongst us. That's not what they say. They say find seven men who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom of the spirit and wisdom that's what they need to have the responsibility for taking this forward uh, one of the things i often get asked by churches is we don't have any youth leaders how do we get more youth leaders uh, and most churches will stand at the front of a church on a sunday and say we don't have any youth leaders please someone put a hand up uh, and and we rarely get traction sometimes we get a few people who go actually yeah i'd love to help but most of the time we don't and the way that i encourage churches to recruit new youth leaders is i say get get four or five of you who are really concerned about this problem committed to finding a solution and why don't you gather together for a month every week and pray together that the lord will raise up the number of leaders that you need and then on a sunday morning or whenever the church meets each of you go around during coffee times saying to as many people in the church as possible, we've got this real issue that we need so many more youth leaders. Who do you think would be good? And what happens is the people get asked, think, oh, wow. Firstly, thank goodness you're not asking me to do it, but you're asking for my help. You're asking for my opinion. 
I could tell you who I think would be a good youth leader. Have you spoken to Graham? Uh, or have you spoken to Susie? Or have you, you know, and, and these names come up. And, oh, that's really interesting. And we get the people to write the names down. And then they meet each week and they pray over the names that are coming in. You do it for a month. So you've, you've heard everyone's had a chance to, to give their opinion. And of course, what happens is as church, we're, we're all we suddenly know there's a real need for youth leaders. And then after the month, the team get together and they say, wow, it's interesting, Graham and Susie are coming up more than, more than any other names. So then they go to Graham and Susie and say, Graham, as you know, we, we need more youth leaders and we're praying for youth leaders. And we've been asking the church who might be good. And your name's come up quite a few times. Would you, would you consider praying about it and actually just exploring whether you, being a youth leader might be something that God is calling you to do at this time? The great thing is, the worst thing that can happen is Graham feels really encouraged because the church is saying, oh, we've seen something in you. And the problem with most times of when we do volunteering is we think, oh, I suppose I'll do it. And it's not the right heart attitude. Whereas when you know the church is going, we think you might be good at this. It, it, it sets you on the right footing. And as I read this passage, I, was, I see a similarity in what the, what the apostles were doing to raise up leaders, saying, church, who do you think should do this job? So maybe we need to change the way we recruit for all roles. It's not just the, 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 the roles that we think are the most important. It's every role. And what I love about this is they choose these seven people uh, and in verse 5, it says they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, also six others, and they presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. This is an administrative task, and yet they gather them before the church and their leaders, and the leaders put their hands on them and pray for them, because there's, there's no such thing as a purely functional task in the church. Everything is an act of worship. Everything is an act of ministry. And we're going to pray for you. And we're going to be asking the Lord to fill you with his spirit. And so what happens in verse 7 is we see that the word of God spread. And the number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly. And a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. It's wonderful, isn't it? What could have distracted the church and stopped them being as effective gets simple technique to sort it before the Lord. The church is probably encouraged and brought together a bit more because, yes, we want to make sure we're caring for everybody. And as a result, the church continues to grow and the word of God uh, spreads. Uh, and then the, the, the rest of chapter six and chapter seven focuses on this one person, Stephen. Now, remember, Stephen has been chosen for one of the seven because in verse 3, the apostles say they must be full of the spirit and wisdom. In verse 5, we see that Stephen is chosen a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. And now we see in verse 8, Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, performed great wonders and signs among the people. What a man who's chosen just to, to sort out this function of, of people missing out on being fed. What a man of God he is. Uh, and it's, it's, it's so important that actually when we look for the different roles we're trying to fulfill, it's the heart, it's the character of a person, it's their relationship with Jesus that must priori be prioritized above any ability. As some of you may know we run a youth growing leaders course every year and it's been wonderful this last uh, year or so to be running it again since having to pause it during the pandemic. And we've had a dozen young people uh, or so on the course coming from half a dozen local churches. We just finished uh, in, uh, in April and we use this model for Christian leadership. You may have seen it before, but I would love just to talk you through it because it reflects what's going on here. Basically, it's got this picture of a triangle, uh, and uh, it starts with right at the center of your life, the triangle being you, 
at the center of your life, knowing that you are chosen by God and that you are his beloved child, because that has got to be at the center of every Christian, knowing that we're his and we're chosen. And then what we talk about is that as a Christian leader, you've got a calling. But as a Christian, you've got a calling. Each one of us, God is calling us for a particular reason. Of course, we have the, 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 the overarching calls for all of us, which are summed up in the great commandments and the, greatest, um, the great commission. But we also have specific callings on our lives. Uh, I know for me, the Lord is calling me to, to reach out to young people and to, to make sure every young person, there is not a young person that walks in our area who doesn't have the opportunity to hear about Jesus. That's what I believe God's calling me to do. He called me at 14 to do that, and I feel like I've been trying to do that ever since. We also talk about having Christ-like character. It's no good to be a leader without the character of Christ. We lead in his image, in his name. So how am I as a Christian growing more like him? And isn't it interesting that that's what we're seeing, the apostles choosing for these leaders to sort this task out. They're looking for people full of faith and wisdom, Christ-like character. And then we talk about competence, the skills. It is useful to have some kind of competency in what you're doing, but you can learn that, you can grow in skills. But our focus must always be on the stuff. Below the surface, we talk about this sometimes being like an iceberg, popping out of the water with the water level above the word chosen. So chosen, call, and character is all hidden. You know, my calling, my, my character, and my sense of being chosen by God, unless you know me, and unless I tell you, you won't know, because it's hidden. We don't know what, what's really going on in our lives unless we know each other well. But we see the competencies. And we talk about this being done in, the, in, the, uh, in, a, in a, a safety net of community. As the church, we've got to be together. We can't be individuals. And if you think of any leader that's fallen or failed or had public fall from grace, it's not the competency thing is where they fall. It's the stuff, the other stuff, the stuff that's hidden unless it gets exposed. And what the apostles here are doing are going, make sure you focus on his character. Make sure you focus on his heart. For the Lord? Does he know he's chosen? Is he following the, 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 the Lord in all he can do? Uh, is he doing it with others? They choose seven, not one, because it's much easier to live in community with fellow believers, not on our own. Uh, and so we use this model for, for young people thinking about being Christian leaders in whatever workplace, whether that's inside the church, whether it's in their sports team, in their community group, whatever form of uh, work place they go into. It's not being church leaders, it's being leaders who lead in a Christian way, no matter where we find ourselves. And so we see with Stephen, this man of faith, of God, full of God's grace and power, performing great wonders and signs, so much so that he upsets the religious folk. Uh, and they're like, this can't be wrong. Verse, this can't be right, sorry. Verse 9 says, opposition arose. However, from members of the synagogue on, and the freedmen, as it was called, uh, and they began to argue with Stephen, but they could not stand up against the wisdom the Spirit gave him as he spoke. They could not stand up against the wisdom of the Spirit that Stephen spoke. It wasn't they couldn't stand up against Stephen, but the Spirit was speaking through him because he was full of the Holy Spirit. He was full of God's grace. Uh, and, and that's so important, that we are full of the Holy Spirit because he can work through us when we allow him to do that. So what happens? We're going to speed through the next few verses. Don't worry, it's not going to go on forever. Uh, we get Stephen is seized on trumped up charges. They, they convince the Sanhedrin, the, the Jewish sort of um, ruling body, the religious leader ruling body, that this man is, is a danger, a threat. He's saying things he shouldn't be. Uh, and we, they make up uh, charges against him that brings him before this, this board, this body. And in verse 15, there's this wonderful line that says, all who were sitting in the Sanhedrin looked intently at Stephen 
And they saw that his face was like the face of an angel. Oh man, imagine that. We all hate this man. And yet we're all looking at him thinking, hmm, there's something about this man that's different. He looks like an angel. And I don't know about you, when I read this, I'm like, well, how, did they, how does Luke know that to record it? Which one of the Sanhedrin was going, did you notice he looked like an angel? Because that's an awkward thing to admit. So who, who is picking that out? Who is noticing that? It's just one of those things that pops into my head as I read scripture. There's something about this man that's concerning them, and yet they see his face shining like an angel. Reminds me of Moses coming down the mountain when he radiates God's glory. And don't you know that when someone's on fire for the Lord, you can kind of see it in their face? I, uh, our middle child, Dan, has been on a gap year this year, and he went out to New Zealand. Uh, and he was, he was off the grid for a month with uh, a project with OM, fantastic Christian leadership course he did. Uh, and, our, and when we had our first uh, FaceTime conversation after his first month, his face was shining. And we were like, Dan, what's happened? There's just, we could just see you are fully alive in Christ right now for what you're doing. Have you seen that with us? I'm, I'm sure you have. I hope you have. Because there is something that when we're fully engaged and fully in, in love with our Lord, that our faces can't help but, but say it. Can't help but say it. And let's not be ashamed of that. Let's, let's, let's release that. So what happens? Stephen, chapter 7, gives this speech to the Sanhedrin. He's asked, are these charges true? And he goes through their joined history. He knows their story because he's one of them. But he sees the ending differently. So he goes back to Abraham and he takes them through what God has been doing with them uh, and the story of, of Moses and how God leads them out of Egypt and how he takes them across the, the Red Sea and how the Lord continues to invest in them. Uh, and, and, it, and it's an amazing story. Uh, I'd really recommend just go and see how well Stephen knows his story. But we don't have time to go through that this morning. But the thing that stood out for me is how well do we know our story? How well do you know the story of Saltisford Church, the, the fellowship you are part of? And, and my reflection is, I don't think we tell each other our stories very much anymore. Uh, if we're a parent or a grandparent, do you tell your children and grandchildren your own story of faith? Do, do your children know how you came to faith? Do, do we as brothers and sisters in Christ know how we came to faith? Do we know what's been going on, what, what God has been doing in our lives? in the last year or two. Why do we not talk about it more? We should know it, because it's so important that we remember it, because when you get put on the spot, we can remind each other of God's goodness. We can remind each other, of, this may be difficult, but God's, God's not let us down, and he's not letting us down now. It's so important for our children to know that, that this isn't just a theoretical thing, and you can take it or leave it, you can go and play golf, or you can go to church. It's not a either or, it's a, this is what life's about. Let me tell you about this living God who made the difference in my life. We need to be talking about it, relating our stories. And if we're fortunate enough to come from generations of those who follow Jesus, we want to know that heritage passed down through our children. And I, I, I fear that too often we forget to pass on that baton. We talk about the baton of faith. Uh, and we, we, that part of that baton is our testimony, our story of our regular encounters with our Heavenly Father. So Stephen shares this story, and he goes right up to David uh, with the tabernacle, and then wanting to build a permanent place for, 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 for Yahweh, for God, to, to inhabit. And he says in verse 47 of chapter 7, but it was Solomon who built a house for him. However, the Most High does not live in houses made by human hands. As the prophet Isaiah says, and he quotes Isaiah 66, when he says, Heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or where will my resting place be? Has not my hand made all these things? And then he challenges the Sanhedrin. You stiff-necked people 
Your hearts and ears are still uncircumcised. You are just like your ancestors. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Wow. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Was there ever a prophet your ancestors did not persecute? They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one. And now you have betrayed and murdered him. You who have received the law that was given through angels, but have not obeyed it. <laughs> what a surprise. They don't like what they hear. And they, as we see in verse 54, that they, when they hear this, they are furious and gnash their teeth at him. Uh, and Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looks to heaven for his response. Uh, and there's, there's this wonderful story that uh, I, I don't know if it's apocryphal or whether it actually happened, because I've seen it so many times, you may have heard it. But there's this story of this, this concert pianist who gets to perform in Carnegie Hall for the first time. Uh, and he goes out and he performs this incredible uh, concert. At the end, he stands up to take his bow, and there's just an eruption of applause and a standing ovation. And he walks off the stage, and his manager comes up to him and goes, oh, that was amazing, that's so good. You've got to get out there for the encore. That was brilliant. And the pianist turned around and said, I don't think it was as good as that. And the manager said, what are you talking about? They're all on their feet. And the, the pianist turns around and goes, well, did you look at the balcony? Because they're not all on their feet. And the manager's like, oh, ah. So he goes out and peeks, and he notices there's one guy in the balcony who's still sitting down. And he comes back to the pianist, because they're all on their feet in the balcony, except this one old guy with gray hair who probably can't stand. Don't listen to him. Look at everybody else. And the pianist turns around to his manager and says, you don't understand. That old gray-haired man was my piano teacher. And, and he wasn't on his feet for me. Uh, and, and, and what we see with Stephen here, he doesn't look around and see everyone hates him. Oh, I must have got this wrong. I must have stuffed up. I, I've got to have got this wrong. He looks to heaven. Verse 55, Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of the, of the Father of God. And he says to, says to the Sanhedrin, look, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Wow. He's not looking at the rest of the audience. He's looking at his one audience of Jesus. And what I love is it says that he sees Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Whenever we read about Jesus in heaven, what is he? Seated at the right hand of God. Here are three verses, just quickly, to, 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 to illustrate that. From Luke chapter 22, Jesus says to Pilate, but from now on the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the mighty God. In Ephesians chapter 1, that power, that Holy Spirit, is the same power of the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. And Colossians 3, since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. And yet here we have Stephen looking up and Jesus is on his feet going, go on, my boy. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't it great that Jesus is cheering him on from the heavenly realms? And so Stephen looks to him and goes, well, I'm following you, Jesus. And so they take him out to stone him, but his eyes are on the one that he lives for and he serves. Uh, and what's interesting, I think, as we close, is in verse 58, it says, they dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats, those who were watching, laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. And they stoned Stephen, and the beginning of chapter 8 says, and Saul approved of their killing him. You know, when we go, who in the Sanhedrin said his face was like the face of an angel? I wonder if that was Paul, when Saul became Paul after his transformation. I wonder if he went, do you know what? I was seeing it then. I just couldn't give in to it. I don't know, but it makes me wonder. 
It makes me wonder, but there was Saul watching and approving what was going on. And yet here's Stephen, this great man of faith, having an eternal perspective. It's about the future. It's about my eternal life, not my, my passing comfort right now. And yet too many of us Christians are living with the security of our daily comfort rather than our eternal uh, treasures. Uh, and we need to, to turn it around. We need to keep our eyes on him. And it means it's not about my abilities. It's not about all that I can do for him. It's actually about being full of the Holy Spirit and full of faith. Stephen was a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit. And he had his eyes on Jesus the whole time. And if we want to see more people come to know Jesus, if we want to be a church that stands up for Jesus, no matter what the world around us says, we mustn't look at the world around us for affirmation. We must look to Jesus for our affirmation. And we must do that as the community, the fellowship, the family of God, because it's too hard to do on our own. To close I'm a massive Olympic Games fan. I don't know about you, I was an athlete as a teenager. I'm really excited. My youngest has finally followed in his father's footsteps. The other two couldn't be bothered. Uh, and, uh, and so we were, at, we were at Nuneaton Athletics track yesterday, and he was taking part in that. Uh, and there's a, there's a story of Michael Johnson, who was the uh, first man to win gold medals in the same Olympics in the 200 meters and 400 meters in 1996. And he was asked, uh, how, do you, how do you win a race? How do you win a gold medal? Uh, what do you do on the track that makes the difference? And he said, what I do on the track makes no difference to whether I win or lose the gold medal. I win the gold medal in the training. I win the gold medal by getting up when I don't want to early in the morning. It's easy on the track, but it's hard in the training. Uh, and he said, it's all about whether I'm going to take the right diet, whether I'm not going to go out for those parties with other people celebrating. But I'm going to choose to focus on what I'm trying to do. You win it in the training, you don't win it on the track. And I see that Stephen here, he, 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 he won this in the training, not on the track. He won this because he was full of faith and wisdom, that he would spend times with his Heavenly Father. He knew Jesus. He was surrounded by people who were, were cheering uh, for Jesus, for no one else. He was seeing signs and wonders taking place because the Spirit was working through him. If we want to see our town saved for Jesus, yes, it's about getting out there, but it's also, it starts with what we're doing in the quiet. What are we doing each day to be filled with the Holy Spirit, to be, to be full of faith and just delighting in who he is? And how can I become more like him, that I reflect his glory, that you reflect his glory? Because that's what we're made to be. That's what we're made to be. Let me pray for us. Father, we know that the devil's tactic is always to distract the church because he fears us and he fears you. But Stephen was clearly single focused on you, Jesus. And our prayer is that that is who we will be as the people of God in this place. Give us that single focus that it's, we live for you. It's you that we get our affirmation from. And we thank you, Heavenly Father, that you look down on each one of us and you delight in us. You look at your creation and go, wow, every time. That each one of us, it's not one of us who you don't adore who you're not proud of because you delight in us. Draw us close to you. Draw us close to you. Fill us with your Holy Spirit and may we be open to whatever you want us to do. For your kingdom's sake we pray. Amen.